DJ the Smart Guy. What's going on, brother? Tell the audience, tell the world a little bit about yourself for the Bitcoin source. Man, how you doing? My real name is Charles J. Kelly. I'm a certified public accountant. They call me CJ the Smart Guy. And I just got done touring with Naja Roberts around the country to educate our communities on the evolution of money, which we believe to be Bitcoin. Word, word. Um, you know, to kick things off on this show, I usually ask people, where did they source their Bitcoin knowledge, whether it be books, courses, conferences? So could you kind of break down for the audience what kind of books or courses or even people in the Bitcoin space that inspired you to learn more about uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, so there's lots of pieces to it. Um, first, there was a movie called Dope with ASAP Rocky in it. I watched that and it inspired me just to download the Coinbase app. They gave me like 25 free dollars. At the time, I was like super broke. So like, I really needed that 25 free dollars. But then they wouldn't let me take it off. So I forgot all about it. And uh, my homeboy hit me up like maybe a year later because we had both downloaded it. And he was like, hey, bro, we're rich. I'm like, we rich? What you what you talking about? And so I, you know, check it out. And, you know, that $25 turned like $700-something. And I was like, whoa. And so, I mean, I sold that immediately, paid off my rent. I was like, man, this is great. But then uh, my, my mentors, Dr. Boyce Watkins and Nipsey Hussle, they both, you know, encouraged me to, continue to study this stuff. And so Dr. Boyce Watkins led me to Lamar Wilson, which led to the Black Bitcoin Billionaires. And the Nipsey Hustle that led to a class at UC Berkeley, um, where it was like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, and so I got my certification in that. And so then between studying both of those, at the same time as studying my CPA license, when December 2020 and Bitcoin started rising, that's when Black Bitcoin Billionaires took off. And me being a CPA, it was like, a perfect fit. So four years of struggling turned into a really nice opportunity. Word. And, you know, I love to hear that you talk about Boyce Watkins, Dr. Boyce Watkins. Um, you know, I would say that I'm a student of him as well. And I'm one of my favorites is definitely Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his his model, the way he approaches economics for black people is just spot on. So it's dope to see like your transition and what you've learned in the space. And like, you know, a lot of people, they'll just reference books like the Bitcoin Standard, or like the Fiat Standard, some of Safe Dean's books, other people's books in the space. And it's just dope to kind of see how people evolve and change in the space. And they kind of learn through just peer-to-peer -peer conversation instead of just like literature or books. And some people even learn from podcasts or YouTube. So it's just really good to hear kind of like your perspective from a CPA in, you know, where you source your Bitcoin knowledge. Yeah, it's funny because I was studying for my exam before any crypto was even on the exam. And I remember when the very first crypto question I saw, I was like, oh, I'm ahead of the game. You know, because when you're studying for the CPA, like, it's frustrating because no matter how much you think you know, you learn you don't know anything. And so to finally see something where I was ahead of the, ahead of the curve, that was a great feeling. Um, and it's led to lots of opportunities because there's not too many CPAs who actually truly understand this crypto space as an entirety. I get it. Um, you know, in my new book, I talk about, I have a chapter about crypto taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And the importance of African-Americans being aware of audits and taxable events. So could you explain to the audience what type of events people may encounter while buying, selling, or trading cryptocurrencies? Yeah, for sure. So just to give you the full background of it, um, originally crypto, it wasn't really considered money. Like it wasn't really a big issue. Um, and so... The way the IRS looked at it was just, you know, property. Um, and so before 2017, you could do like kind exchanges, meaning if you buy Ethereum, you sell it, you know, exchange it for Bitcoin, you exchange it for XRP, you exchange it for XLM. None of those were taxable events back then because they were considered like kind exchanges. But in 2017, they changed that. They said, hey, um, there are no more like kind exchanges unless it's for real estate. And so now all these every time you sell it, every time you spend it, every time you exchange it for another crypto, all of those now are taxable events and they're capital gains slash losses. And they all have to be reported on a form 8949. And so people who are in this DeFi space, people who are consistently just trading, 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 you know, the perspective I like to give people, is I say for every time you spend, trade or sell, just add a 15 to $20 accounting fee onto it. Now, would you still do that trade? Would you still spend it? You know, if you're making thousands of dollars, you're not worried about that $20 fee. But if you're spending $5 at Starbucks or something like that, the accounting fee is higher than what you spent it on. It's not really worth it. Um, and so 
Then there's other people who like to earn income in Bitcoin and crypto. And so if they're doing that, it's really not taxed any different. Um, it's just, you know, just as, as you would with U.S. dollars, you just look at the fair market value of what the amount of Bitcoin is worth in U.S. dollars at that time and you report that. But then once again, every time you sell it, spend it or exchange it, all those create taxable events and those have to be reported. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, I gl I'm glad that you brought up the fact about earning crypto as like a form of income. Because me being a freelance writer, sometimes my clients will pay me in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. But I try to tell them to just send it in either regular money or Bitcoin. But you know, can you kind of break down like some tax. of those tax software programs? Like, you know, I use Coin Ledger. There's some other ones out there, but. I know you have like some qualms with the tax software where you said they're not that great, but as a CPA, like kind of like tell people about your frustration with those, with those software programs. Yeah. So whenever you have automation, there's always going to present issues. So what I don't want people to do is depend on the software entirely and think that that's perfect. And in this crypto space, even when you're receiving 1099s or any tax documents in this crypto space, they're guilty until proven innocent, meaning they're wrong until you can prove that it's correct because it's all brand new. Everybody's trying to figure it out. And most people haven't spent the amount of time in the space that they really should. Like I have one client, you know, multi-billion dollar company and they're doing things wrong. You get what I'm saying? Like they're doing stuff wrong. Now, years later, their employees are really upset because now they're wrongdoing from two or three years ago before they were my client, you know, now, you know, you're seeing all the problems on the back end. And so, you know, me being a CPA, I look at these tax softwares. The one that I use the most is Coinly, Coinly with a K. Um, they haven't paid me. I have no, um, you know, loyalty to any of them right now, but that one seems to be the best. But even then I don't trust the, the dollar amounts. I like it mostly because it allows you to organize things. It's easy to connect to the APIs. You can upload your transaction sheets. And so for me, it's just easier than some of the other ones because some of them don't even keep track of your cost basis. Some of them don't keep track of um, other things. But then even with Coinly, you can't go from year to year to year and keep track of it. It's just a one year or you know thing. So if I have a client from two or three years, I have to manually go in and you know take things out. It's it, none of them are good. That's how I feel. But they're none of, they're not good because the crypto space was not built for taxes. It wasn't built like literally the crypto space was created to get out of the current system. So I can't really blame the tax softwares for it. But at the same time, I wouldn't trust any of them in entirety because their numbers most of the time are wrong. The 1099s that you receive from these companies are going to be wrong. The IRS, when they send you notes, is going to be wrong. You just have to know what you're doing and stand on it. And if you do that, actually the taxes in this crypto space are actually pretty favorable right now. It's just, you got to get through all the, you know, the minutia. <laughs> you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, like the tax software is kind of sketchy. So if you need a certified CPA, go to my brother, CJ, the smart guy. My, my next question is, you know, I see you empowering and uniting people on tour with Naja Roberts, the digital finance, financial revolution tour. Um, how has being involved with that tour inspired people in your opinion, to take control of their money? Oh, for sure. So last year, so in 2021, so first in 2020, I went on my own tour, uh, but I was poor pimping it, right? It was before I was a CPA and I was driving my own car and I was driving Uber to get from one place to another because I didn't have any money. And as soon as I was done with my tour, my car died out because I didn't put the oil in it like I should have. <laughs> and so, you know, I did that. One of the things that I learned when I was working in corporate America was to go meet the people face to face. Um, you can do things digital, you can be on videos, you can be on camera, but it's always different when you see the person, you know, face to face. It's like if you're watching basketball, you know, rest in peace to Kobe. But if you see him on TV, it's a lot different than when you see him in person. Like, whoa, you're tall. Like, you know, you, you can really ball, you know, so. I made it a point in 2020 to make sure that I'd saw my clients at least once every other year, just to make sure I saw them. And so when Naja in 2021, she was like, Hey, I'm going on tour so I can educate the communities on Bitcoin. It was like a no brainer. Cause I had already did it. But like I said, I was poor pimping it. Like I had nothing. Um, and so I was like, well, now I'm a CPA. Let me be able to, you know, stay in my lane and just show people the CPA crypto side. 
And that was big. 2021 was huge. And then in 2022, I feel like it grew even more. And the inspiration I could see in people, you know, the thing is that in 2022, we had a lot of different experts. And so Black Regal is always talking about self-sovereignty. And, you know, I feel like he repeated the same thing over and over and over again. But once it clicks, it clicks. You know, one of the things he, he says consistently was it's not the grocery store's responsibility to feed you. You know, and at first glance, you're like, well, I know that it's my responsibility. But then you start thinking, he says it again. And you're like, hmm, when's the last time I didn't go to a grocery store to eat? Was it the gas station? Well, that's still a convenience store. Was it, you know, if I went to my neighbor's house or, or a cookout, did they get it from the grocery store? We're depending on convenience stores and grocery stores. And those are just businesses. If that business goes out, are we going to be able to eat? And so through a lot of his consistent talking about that, man, I know on my end, I'm very inspired. I want to start canning stuff. I want to start growing stuff. And to see the people, because, you know, some places we're in the country where they already, you know, grow their own food. They're like, wow, now they're self-sovereign money. You mean I can travel around the whole world and, you know, not have to have current, you know, foreign exchange rates. I don't have to worry about going through these banks. And so it was like the inspiration for different people was completely different. And so just seeing everybody in totality, I was like, yeah, this is why they say Bitcoin's for everybody because we all appreciate a different aspect of it. And, you know, it was just great from millionaires to poor people to business owners to W2 people. It was like everybody saw something in it and to be able to speak on what's important to them, man, that was, it was inspiring to me to see them inspired. That's super dope, man. And, you know, I got to, I got to respect like your, your relentless hustle and speaking of hustle, I know that you're a big Nipsey Hustle fan as well as I am. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the questions I had in my mind when I, when I thought about this interview was, you know, you being such a big fan. And I remember on one of your previous interviews, you talked about mail, mailbox money, the album mailbox money, and how that's been so inspirational in your life as like a CPA and entrepreneur and just an overall businessman. So could you kind of break down the hustler's mentality and how that transmitted into Bitcoin for you? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, so. 08, I moved from Houston. I mean, I moved from California to Houston for school. And if you look at the politics, if you look at demographics, California and Texas are like the most powerful opposites, meaning like California is the most powerful Democratic state, Texas is the most powerful Republican state. And so the ideologies are so drastically different. I was struggling. Like I was struggling in a major way because I'm like, man, everything that's good in, in California is bad here and vice versa. And I was just looking for somebody who was, you know, older or had a, you know, better understanding of the world. And, you know, Nip was like five years older. And so I was just looking through music. I prayed and I, I found Nipsey just through the music. So I didn't know him in California. Um, but I was like, wow, he has a song called Questions Freestyle where, you know, the censored version is essentially, is that your friend or a snake in disguise if that friend will give you advice that'll lead to your demise? And I was like, oh, he's thinking on a whole different level than, you know, the majority of these rappers, the majority of these people, I have a reference point of somebody I can listen to. And unlike a parent, unlike teachers, unlike a job or a boss, you choose who you listen to. When you put those headphones in, you're choosing who you're listening to. And so if you're, if you're listening to people who aren't feeding you, you know, nourishment, if you're, if you're listening to a bunch of trash or things that are encouraged to do the wrong things, then you know, you are whatever you consume, whether you eat it, listen to it, you are what you consume, you know, faith comes by hearing. Well, that's part of, you know, that's part of consuming. So if I'm listening to somebody who's giving me nourishment, that was major. And so from 08 all the way until, you know, continuously, the music has always been there, but originally it was just the music. Then I started look, looking at the business models, right? In 2013, he dropped mailbox money. 2014, I met him for the first time. Sorry, 2013, he dropped Crenshaw. Um, I met him in 2014. That's when he dropped Mailbox Money. And on there, he was talking about the business models and how we need to start studying them because big companies are going to crumble. Things are about to change drastically. And so if you look at the music industry, they were hit by decentralized technology first, you know, Kazaa, LimeWire. And even though it's not blockchain basic, but the concept of I don't have to go to a music store to buy music. 
that's why you saw record sales just completely collapse because we could send it peer to peer. I can, why would I buy a, a song, you know, or an album for $10 when I could get it for free from LimeWire? And that's why a lot of record labels were struggling. That's why artists were struggling. And so he figured out a way to say, hey, let's move out of the system. I'll just go directly to the people. But at the same time, I'm gonna utilize the technology, meaning he had a phrase called um, never by force, always by choice. So he, he gave the music for free on the internet. He allowed you to pay for it if you wanted to through iTunes, but if you wanted to just download on that pit, you could. And then he said, but if you want the physical copy, it's gonna be $100. Mailbox money is gonna be $1,000, but you're gonna be included in the community um, if you do this. So when we flash forward to five years later, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, we're looking at this NFT market. I'm like, he had a physical NFT back in 2013, where it was like, if you buy the physical copy, it's a limited amount, you're gonna be brought into a community. And, you know, that was done way before this NFT started taking off. And so me being an accountant, all I did was just re-engineer everything because music and art is normally the first industry to get hit by technology accounting is normally the last. So that space, that time period, I can just utilize all that, just study everything he was studying, duplicate his business models, re-engineer for mine. And so when it comes to the hustle, it's like, okay, how did he get his business going? He got a, he had a clothing line. So what I do, I got me a clothing line. Um, he has music. I'm not a rapper at all, but I was like, let me create a podcast where I'm still talking directly to the people. Um, let's create you know, SGC, smart guy clothing, smart guy community, smart guy company. That's no difference than TMC, the marathon clothing, the marathon continues. Just re-engineer it, but do it for yourself because at the end of the day, I'm not a rapper. But if I can utilize my mentor in a way to help me benefit, man, and then you give props to him, that's how the hustle keeps going and that's how it evolves. Facts, facts. And you know, I follow a lot of those principles myself and... You know, there was a saying that Nipsey always said, which was never look a gift horse in the face. Mm -hmm. And I think about that when I, when I, when I see you and I see you moving around the space and like, there's not that many CPAs of color in the crypto space talking about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So, you know, Nipsey has been widely instrumental for me as an entrepreneur, a writer, podcaster, author, everything, all of these different things of vacillation that I'm doing in the space is kind of really backed by his hustle and his hustler mentality. And the interesting thing too, is like, he was on the crypto space really early in the game with follow coin, even though it was an alternative coin, he did, he did talk about Bitcoin. He did say, Hey, this is an early opportunity. And if we get in now, we'll have a seat at the table instead of begging for a seat at the table. So Nipsey was definitely forward thinking and ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, when I was working at him, so, I started working at a Vector 90, which was his co-op spot um, some years later. I don't remember the exact years and dates, but I started working out of there. And so I wasn't a CPA yet, but I was working towards it. So I met his business partner, Dave Gross, and I started meeting his community. And I just really realized like, you know, when you understand that less than 1% of CPAs are black, there's a huge detriment in our community that we don't understand financial literacy. And even the people who think that they do, even the ones who are making money, they don't truly understand money at all. Or if they do, they're missing some huge pieces to it. And, you know, it is a gift horse when you're looking at it, because it's like from a business perspective, I literally can corner this entire market. But for me, it's not about um, just the capitalism and capitalizing off of my own people. It's about, well, let me educate them. Because another thing you said is the biggest, um, you know, one of the most things, that the, one of the highest things that you can do is to inspire the human acts. The one of the highest human acts you could do is to inspire. And so as I, well, if I can inspire other people to become CPAs, let's, let's get that 1% up because there's enough money in this all to eat. We don't need to be beefing. Like that's Willie Lynch. Like we don't need to do that. We can work together and, you know, let, let's bring up the 1% first. And then once we get the percentage of CPAs up, to where we are on the same level playing field around 13%, then we can compete. But like, let's not do that now. Like, let's not fight when we're like, that's just crazy. Like BBB is 155,000 people. I'm one CPA. Look, I'd be happy if there were other four or five, 10 other, 20 other CPAs that I can work with in this space. Cause I can't service 155,000 people by myself. So, 
you know, let me inspire some younger people, get in this space. It takes a while, you know, it took me four or five years. And that was after I had all the prerequisites. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, there are plenty of barriers to entry being a CPA, but like I said, there's, there's enough money in this for us all to eat. So no reason to compete, at least not yet. Let, let's compete when we're up there. You know, and in the words of Nipsey Hussle, forget what they saying, I'm saying this. And it's, you know, you inspire me. That's what I'm saying to the to the world and to the audience that, you know, we need to have more people in the space like you and you're welcoming other CPAs. You're not trying to, you know, backbite or backdoor anybody. You you want to see the, the, the community be bolstered in having financial literacy. And that's why you have my utmost respect. 100% CJ. Uh, my last question is, uh, as a certified CPA, what's easier to deal with crypto clients or traditional tax clients? Hmm. Easier. Easy is a very, uh, broad word meaning. So I like to say this, there's typically like four different types of categories in this crypt in the, not in the crypto in the tax space. You have your low income earners who they normally get money back from the government. Um, they get the earned income credit. They get a lot of benefits just for being low income because the government wants to subside, subsidize a lifestyle so that A, you know, they don't revolt and then B, um, so they can capture those votes. So those people are typically the ones that the very beginning of tax season, they're like, hey, I need my taxes done. Like the their very first day, they're, they're knocking at the door before we can even file anything because they're, they're hungry, they're ready for it. Um, Typically, their tax returns are actually easy to do, but the amount of knocking that they're doing is like, man, you got to chill because there's 30, 40 people and I can't even do anything yet. Um, so that's the difficulty in that. Then you typically have like the middle class. If anything with them, it's more like, hey, you got to do your taxes. They don't want to do their taxes. They want, they want me to motivate them to do their taxes because they don't get a big refund. Sometimes they owe a little bit of money. It can be more complicated, meaning the juice isn't worth the squeeze. They're like, why would I go through all of this for $20 refund? You know, but it's like, hey, you got to do it. Like, so the lower class, there's their motivation is there. I don't got to, I don't got to, you know, motivate them at all, but I got to tell them to chill. Middle class, a lot of times you got to motivate them. And the rich people, the ones who are making, you know, about three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, you got to kind of be their therapist because they're going to be angry. They're mad at the world because rich people pay more taxes than anybody else, period. They're upset. You know, if they work a W-2 job, they're, they're seeing, man, 40% of my paycheck came out in taxes, 20, 30, 40. And they have a genuine reason. So a lot of times I just have to be patient, listen to them, you know, explain, hey, these are some strategies you might want to incorporate. You might want to become a business owner. I don't want to go through a business, a business. That's too much. Well, you know, I have to be patient, understanding with them. And then you have the wealthy people. These are the ones who are like, hey, CJ, I'll pay you whatever it needs. I don't want to pay any taxes at all. You know, they typically pay the least amount of taxes out there. So they're just like, here, just, just take care of it. How much you need? Done. I don't want to pay any taxes. So they're actually the easiest. But once again, it's like, well, is easy my target demographic? Is my goal to make a whole bunch of money? Or is my goal to help the community? The wealthy people don't necessarily... And they already know what they're doing. They, they are, know that's why they hired me in the first place. That's why they have multiple CPAs on retainer, have multiple lawyers. So it's not always about what's easy. It's about, okay, what is my intention? What's my purpose? I want to help empower my people, not just help the wealthy people. You get what I'm saying? So when you look at intentions, easy isn't one of the things that come to my mind. But the difference between the taxes and the crypto, the trader, the crypto traders are by far the hardest tax thing to do because a most of the traders don't want to pay taxes b they don't understand taxes and then c the taxes are extremely difficult and then four they're getting notices from the irs that aren't real they're getting 1099s that aren't real so literally it's like they're trying to trust me and there's no way to verify anything because the IRS doesn't know what they're talking about yet. The 1099s don't know what they're talking about yet. They're hearing that Bitcoin is not taxable and the revolution is on, revolution is on. So by far the crypto traders are the hardest ones to do because most of them don't believe in paying taxes. Most of them don't understand the tax and they're getting false information from so many different places that it's difficult. But those are also the people I'm trying to help out the most, the traders, 
and you know anybody who's trying to find the education aspect yeah and it's like it's like different levels right like it's like going up going up going up and it's like every time you get into a new tax bracket there's new issues that you're going to run into and you know as a cpa i think that you know with this loomis bill possibly if it passes with the 200 dollars not being taxed mm -hmm. that might ease up a lot of the the pressure hopefully but they could be more issues with that too because you got to think about people that are spending over that amount or they don't really know about cryptocurrency they're not auditing it or recording it correctly so it's like i think that your career in this space is going to be long-winded and you're going to have a, a, a very interesting um outcome to what you're seeing in the space because it's just it's it's wide open it's like a it's like when people started to conquer the west you know like the frontiers and it's like you're just dealing with all different things and you got to make you got to be the sheriff of your own town you know yeah and it's like people are going to come in and they're going to be like oh you know cj did my taxes or he did this and that and i didn't get the outcome i wanted but guess what you have so many people that have good things to say about you that back you including myself and it's like you have to put in the work too this is about proof of work bitcoin is about proof of work you can't just trade all day and then expect people just expect you to just come in and just save them so I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm grateful for you breaking that down and giving people an understanding of like the tax game because the tax game is i think i seen something online where it said there's like seventy thousand pages in the tax law book and there's like 400 of those pages teach you how to not pay taxes yeah you know yeah. what i mean yeah. so people 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 need cpas and i think that they're beneficial and important in the bitcoin ecosystem man appreciate it. that's love yeah i met senator lummis in washington dc um for the the book, The Bitcoining American Dream, that had Lamar Wilson as well as um, Charlene Federipo in it. And, and Jimmy Song in them. Yep. And Jimmy Song and CJ yep. Wilson. And, uh, you know, it was a long list of people. I think it was like seven, eight people, Gary Leland. Um, and so, you know, I support that bill, um, at least the, the basic framework of it. And if that passes, you're right, it's going to create new headaches. But I feel as though the average person who's just spending their Bitcoin at Starbucks, they can relax a lot more um, because like you said, if they have a $200 limit um, or $200 with grace, grace amount where they don't have to pay a capital gain or loss tax every time they spend it, I think that would be enormous um, for the growth of crypto as a whole. But until then, it's not even in your, it's not even in your benefit to spend crypto at all because you're creating all these taxable events. And like I said, add 15, $20 for accounting fees. If it doesn't make sense, you might not want to do it. That doesn't mean you don't make that $10,000 capital gain. You know, that doesn't mean that, but that $5 spend, probably not worth it. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are just waiting for Gary Gensler's decision, the SEC to like give clear cut regulation on is it a commodity? Is it a security? Like there's so much confusion in the space with that. I mean, I personally think that, you know, Bitcoin is a commodity and I think it should be taxed as such indifferently, but I'm also not a certified public accountant. So this is not financial advice. That's just my opinion. Um, and you know, I think that there's just the people that are wealthy and they are in the know with Bitcoin. They're just kind of waiting. They're just hodling right now. Like you said, the best thing to do is just accumulate as much as you can and hodl it in cold storage. Keep it secure. Keep your private keys secure and just wait it out because it's not ubiquitous in the marketplace yet. Like you can't go to Kroger's and, you know, some of these other places and just spend your Bitcoin as of yet. So just wait it out, people. You know, it's coming, but you just have to try to accumulate and have as much as possible because this is an accumulation race. Yeah. And I think. The biggest confusion is the IRS treats it like property, mm -hmm. not a currency. That's why every time you spend it, it's a capital gain or loss. But then the SEC, they view it as an intangible asset. And so the reason why you're not seeing mass adoption with these big corporations is because let's say you buy Bitcoin at 20,000, it goes up to 60. You can't mark that up. Mm -hmm. Like you don't get the benefit of it going up because it's considered an intangible asset. You, you don't mark it up. But then if you bought it at that 20,000, let's just say it goes down to 5,000, you have to mark it down. So you have to take a loss. So if you're a CEO and you buy Bitcoin and it goes up, you don't get any benefit. And if it goes down, you take all the loss. So why as a CEO would you do that? Because CEOs get fired for taking losses. You don't, and you don't even get a bonus for gaining. So most CEOs thinking about themselves aren't gonna do it. That's why the only CEOs you see really buying Bitcoin 
are ones that aren't thinking for self. They're thinking more about, you know, like micro strategies. He's not thinking about Michael Saylor. He's thinking about micro strategies, my baby. This is long term. You know, you look at Elon Musk. I think it's more of an ego thing, but it's like, hey, look, I already know what's right. I have plenty of other money. I got plenty of other businesses. I'm going to make sure that I set them up for the future. But any of these CEOs who are thinking quarter to quarter or year to year, like almost every company, almost every CEO, every C corporation, Apple, Google, Nike, Facebook, that's how they all think. It's all about profits. So they're not going to buy it. I guarantee you, and we can rewind this back in a few years or whenever it happens. But the day that they say that Bitcoin is not intangible asset, that you can mark it up if it goes up or down when it goes down, if it's at the fair market value, that's when corporations buy at a mass pace. And that's when Bitcoin takes off. To me, that's the beginning of hyper Bitcoinization. And it's all because of an accounting rule. But most people have no idea about that. But Michael Saylor has talked about this. I've talked about this before. The second that rule changes, it's a wrap. This, this Bitcoin conversation has been very insightful, very profound. CJ, tell the audience, tell the world how they can get in contact with you and any last shout outs that you may have. Yeah, for sure. So you can find me on all major platforms at CJ the Smart Guy. No extra spaces, no extra numbers, no dashes, no underlines. It's a lot of fake pages out there. But CJ the Smart Guy on all platforms. You can check out my podcast on YouTube. You can search CJ the Smart Guy on there. No spaces. Um, as well as my website, CJ the Smart Guy. It's trademarked. So I try to keep that, you know, everywhere I go. That's the easiest way to go because Nipsey Hussle came from Nipsey Russell. And he was like, how do I make that on my own? And that's why I was like, in a few years, people are going to be like, Russell who? And I was like, well, how do I stay true to myself? People have been calling me the smart homie for years. So I was like, well, smart guy, TJ, I'm CJ. Let's re-engineer that for me. So CJ the smart guy. So shout outs to uh, Taj Mahari. Shout outs to Nipsey Hussle. Shout outs to Jonah Berger. All of that. So appreciate you. Powerful. Thank you for being on the Bitcoin source, bro. Appreciate it. Appreciate you for having me on. It's an honor. Peace. Peace. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.